Yeah, today is October 12, 2016, and it's finally starting to feel almost wintry out there. Uh, it feels like it could almost snow. You know, we're getting a little bit of rain, but it's getting pretty cold. Though I think it is supposed to warm up this weekend again, so that's good, right? And yeah, you guys have a test in one week. It's Wednesday, next Wednesday, and then the next test again. It'll cover chapters 3, 4, and the first two sections of chapter 5. Though with the second section of chapter 5, probably, my guess, I'm not guaranteeing this yet, probably it'll just focus on definition and theorem statements from that section. Um, maybe a calculation if there's a relevant calculation to do. But uh, the proofs in that section, section 5.2, are probably the hardest proofs in the book um, as far as reading them. Not that you're going to have to do proofs that are, are, are as hard as the ones in the book, but um, it'll be a it'll be a challenge. Let's just put it that way. But I hope it's a challenge that you have a desire to to try to tackle. Do your best. Okay, give your best effort for God's glory in giving that effort. And um, when you do make progress, thanking God for the progress that you do make. All right. Today we're going to continue with the mean value theorems applications, uh, and then we will. I'll mention some things to know from the end of chapter, section 4.2 and the beginning of section 4.3, and then we'll go into chapter 5. Uh, one thing I wanted to remind you of here with the mean value theorem is this warning. Maybe zoom in on that. I'll make it bigger here. Uh, I guess this warning is related to the increase in function theorem. If f is continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the corresponding open interval, and if f prime is bigger than zero for all x in the open interval, then f is strictly increasing on that closed interval, actually. Um, actually, there's two things. One of, I, I, I think I did sort of warn you about both of these last time, but I want to reiterate it. First of all, the converse of this is not true. It's sort of almost true, but uh, you should almost forget you heard me say that. It's not true. Even one counterexample is enough to disprove the converse. What would the converse say if you focus on just the if-then statement here? The converse would say if f is strictly increasing on the closed interval, then the derivative is positive, strictly. On the open interval, that's a false statement. x cubed is an example. <laughs> the simplest example that disproves the converse, shows the converse statement is a false statement. That function is strictly increasing over any interval. Even any interval containing zero. Okay? The tangent line though, f prime of zero is zero. Right? You know that, because the derivative of this function is 3x squared. <coughs> Plug in x equals 0, you get 0. f prime of 0 is 0. The function looks more and more horizontal the closer you zoom in on the origin. But it is strictly increasing. It's never just increasing. It's strictly <coughs> increasing. So we'll prove that back in chapter 1. This function is strictly increasing over any interval. It just looks more and more horizontal. So much so, as you approach the origin, that the tangent line itself is horizontal at the origin. But it is a strictly increasing function. It's never constant over some interval. And you can't say it's constant at a point. That doesn't make sense. You always have to refer to whether a function is constant or increasing over some interval, never at a point. The other warning, looking back up here, this is even perhaps more subtle, is just because f prime of c is positive at some point, that does not mean the function is increasing on some open interval around the point, on some neighborhood of the point. The condition of the increasing function theorem is that the derivative has, has to be positive over some interval, not just at a point. And here again is an example of this. So this function that I made with the if 
command is equal to x over 2 plus x squared times sine of 1 over x when x is non-zero. If x is 0, else, if, you know, the condition for using this formula is when x is non-zero. When x is 0, else, <coughs> the function output is 0. This is a continuous function, and in fact a differentiable function, over the entire real number line, including at zero, and in fact the limit as you approach zero does exist for the difference quotient, and equals one half the derivative of this part at zero is zero, but the x over two here makes the derivative of the entire function one half at zero. And if you zoom in near the origin for this plot, it does look more and more straight it never is actually straight. And in fact, you see some little wobbles in there that get closer and closer. In fact, those wobbles do continue on arbitrary neighborhoods of the origin, no matter how small. To such an extent that on any interval containing the origin, the function has intervals on which it goes down, is decreasing. Even though the derivative at zero is one half, and the, the graph looks more and more like a straight line with a slope of one half as you zoom in near the origin. Those wobbles do continue forever and always have a little piece of them that goes down, that decreases. The derivative of the function exists everywhere, but is, well, I, I made this graph so it's easier to see the wobbling, to see that you've got decreasing functions there, pieces of the graph, I should say. Um, the derivative does exist, but on arbitrary neighborhoods of the origin, it has negative values. That's not a proof right there, by the way. It's just an illustration. If you graph the derivative, it looks like that. And it is sort of centered on one half at zero, so to speak, and its value at zero is one half. But it's not a continuous function on any little neighborhood of the origin. The limit of a derivative as x approaches zero does not exist. But f prime of zero does exist and it's one half. It does satisfy the intermediate value property though, and looking at that graph and thinking about that, and the definition of the intermediate value property makes it somewhat clear that it must. Okay, and we talked about that before. <coughs> okay, let's Briefly review some of the applications of the mean value theorem. We proved the increasing function theorem, part of the monotonicity theorem in the book, in class. There's also a constant function theorem, which is also part of the monotonicity theorem in the book. Let me emphasize what that means. It says if the derivative of a function is always zero over some interval, if the derivative exists and is always zero over some interval, then that function must be constant over that interval, in fact, a slightly bigger interval. This is not contradicted, by the way, by, for example, the floor function, whose graph is constant on different intervals, it's different constants. This function does not contradict the constant function theorem. This function is not continuous at the integer values of x, and therefore can't be differentiable e there either. The graph of the, this, the derivative of this function is zero where it exists, but it doesn't exist at the integer values. So that doesn't contradict the constant function theorem because we are talking about differentiability, well, continuity on a closed interval and differentiability on the corresponding open interval. And if you made your interval contain an integer inside its interior, then that wouldn't satisfy that because we're failing to be differential or continuous at those integer points. How would you prove the constant function theorem? I, I think I'd probably put the proof of the constant function theorem on test before, exams, exam twos from the past. You gotta use the mean value theorem. In a similar kind of way we did with the um, increasing function theorem. Give me two arbitrary numbers, x and y, in the interval from a to b. What's the goal? The goal is to show f of x equals f of y. And since x and y are arbitrary, that would mean f is constant. 
Okay, with that, just, uh, just describe this verbally. You've got to be thinking with it here. <coughs> Give me two arbitrary points, x and y, in the interval. To show f is constant, the goal would be to show that f of x equals f of y. And because x and y are arbitrary, that would mean f is constant. The mean value theorem applied to the function um, on the closed interval from x to y, assuming x is less than y, would mean there's a c in between x and y where f prime of c is zero. You can think of it as Rolle's theorem if you prefer. Okay, we're assuming, no, we're assuming the derivative is always zero. Oh, assuming the derivative is always zero. I guess I better write something. I'm doing it mentally was throwing me off here. But you could write the conclusion of the mean value theorem like this. There would exist a c between x and y where this is true. But I'm assuming f prime of c is zero because f prime of x is always zero, is the assumption. And that would mean that's zero as well, and therefore f of x equals f of y. Doesn't matter what the c is because I'm assuming the derivative is always zero in the open interval, and I do know c is in the open interval. You can use the constant function theorem to prove that antiderivatives of the same function over a given interval differ by constants. You've got two functions that are continuous on the closed interval and differential on the corresponding open interval. And their derivatives are always equal. So there must be some c. So this is true. You could use the mean value theorem to prove it. But once you have the constant function theorem, it's easier to prove. Apply the constant function theorem to the function h of x equals f of x minus g of x. I mentioned this last time. How do you apply the constant function theorem to it? You'd have to show the derivative of h is always zero. But that's easy because of linearity of the derivative in your hypotheses. You're assuming f prime equals g prime for all x. So h prime must always be zero. And therefore h of x must be a constant. <coughs> and that would mean that this is true. You've got to think about these things. They're, they're not obvious if you don't think about them. But once you start thinking about them and then applying these things in the way, just the way I'm telling you here, these proofs are actually pretty easy. Maybe you might even consider them fun compared to epsilon delta proofs. <coughs> Other applications include the first derivative test. I think that's one of your completion problems. In your journal, I would suggest trying to prove the first derivative test as part of your journal. By the way, a little treat, OK? Maybe a big treat. It's only going to be journal stuff between now and the exam. No graded homework, OK? So again, if you're behind in your journal, this gives you a chance to catch up as well. And don't catch up just for the sake of catching up. Catch up because you want to learn, right? The goal of the journal is to learn, not just fulfill some requirement. Of course, that means you, ideally you are keeping up with it. But I think the first derivative test is one of the, um, one of the journal problems. I'd suggest trying that. It could be on the exam to prove the first derivative test. Here's another one. Prove that this function is a general solution of this differential equation, and also it's the unique solution of this initial value problem. Some of you may not have had differential equations in here because you are math ed major. What does this mean? <clears throat> Let me go ahead and use function notation on the board, even though I didn't on the screen. <coughs> Claim f of x equals a e to the bx, using the function notation here now. In differential equations, you often don't bother with function notation. That's kind of why I'm doing it that way on the screen. Is a general solution of 
of the differential equation y prime equals b times y, or if you prefer, dy dx equals b times y. What does that mean? Let's go ahead and do a full proof of this. You have to know what it means to be a general solution. It means really two things. It means any function of this form where a can be any constant does solve the differential equation. It is a solution for any a. The b here does need to match the b there. But the second thing it means is that any solution of the differential equation must be of this form for some a. Again, the b is given. Or at least you can write it in that form, maybe by a little bit of manipulation. So let's prove those two things. Um, <coughs> by the chain rule. And linear, you the derivative of the fact that the derivative of a constant times a function is the constant times the derivative of the function. Do you need to mention linearity? I think you should, actually. And linearity, such an important property of differentiation. f prime of x equals a times e to the bx times b for all x. I guess I'm using the fact that I know derivatives of exponential functions as well. That I think you don't need to mention. But basically, we're done. This essentially proves it because but this equals, but this means f prime of x equals b times f of x for all x. This thing right there in the derivative expression is f of x. f prime of x, its derivative is this which is the same as b times f of x. That's f of x sitting right there. f prime of x equals b times f of x. That's what it means for the function f of x to solve the differential equation. When you substitute it on both sides of the differential equation, you get the same thing upon simplification. Sometimes the simplification is a little trickier than this example. But that's not the only thing to prove. I think for, to save time, I will not write what I'm about to say. This implies any function of this form is a solution, is what I would write if I had more time. Maybe you want to write that. This implies any function like this for any a is a solution of the differential equation. Moreover, let g of x be any function, any solution, of the differential equation. We claim that there must be some a, some constant a, where g of x equals that. Any solution must be able to be put in this form. I'll go ahead and write that as a claim. Claim there exists an a such that g of x equals a times e to the bx. How in the world are you going to prove such a thing? It's a trick, once more. But it's, it's an educated trick. Once you learn these tricks, you realize they are educated, tri educated tricks, so to speak. A little bit of scratch work here. This is not part of the proof here. A little bit of scratch work. This would be equivalent to showing uh, g of x divided by e to the bx always equals a. <coughs> by the way, we're never dividing by zero there, because e to a power is never zero. A constant. This 
showing this is equivalent to showing this is a constant function. That's the key insight. Showing what we want to show means showing this is a constant function. How do you show a function is constant? In the abstract, use the constant function theorem. Show its derivative is always zero. Hmm, doesn't look like the derivative will be zero, does it? Okay, let's be a little official here. Let h of x be g of x divided by e to the bx. I could write, we claim h of x is constant, but I won't. I should note that g or h is continuous and differentiable for all x. G, really by assumption up here being a solution of the differential equation, is itself continuous and differentiable for all x. I didn't mention that up here, but it really is implicit in the assumption that it's a solution for all x. Either the bx is continuous and differentiable everywhere, and I'm never dividing by zero here. Should those things be mentioned? They really should, but for sake of time, I'm not going to. Especially, I think, the e of the bx never being zero part. By the quotient rule, differentiate this thing as follows, h prime of x low d high minus high d low d squared, what's below? Low d high minus high d low, I guess I'm using the chain rule as well. <coughs> Is this dark enough to see? That's fine. Look fine. Zoom in, it looks better. Uh, the derivative of e to the bx will be b e to the bx. Divided by the square of what's below, e to the bx squared, or e to the 2bx. You can also simplify this a little bit by factoring or adding e to the bx out of the top and canceling with the one on the bottom. You can write this as g prime of x minus b times g of x over e to the bx. This is true for all x. Doesn't look like it's zero, does it? So what should you do at this point? What kind of thing should be prompted in your mind when you encounter roadblocks sometimes? That might be helpful. You want to say? Maybe why would the x equal to y? Or the x solution It's any solution. Yeah, we haven't used that assumption yet. That's the light bulb that should go off. I haven't used my assumption yet. That must be relevant. Mm -hmm. G of x is a solution of the differential equation. Its derivative is b times itself. Its derivative is b times itself. So if I do a subtraction up top, this is only 0 for all x by assumption. <coughs> Therefore, by the constant function theorem, there must be some constant, call it A, where h of x always equals A, this is always equal to A, and therefore this is always true. Done. Okay, if I don't write that, I'll say it again. h prime of x is always zero for all x, therefore it's over the entire real number line, therefore, by the constant function theorem, h is constant over the entire real number line. There must be some constant a, such that h of x always equals a for all x. So this equals a for all x. So this is true for all x. Done. You've shown any function that solves the differential equation is of this form. And those two facts together justify saying this is a general solution of that. That's what a general solution means. It solves the differential equation, and any solution can be written in that form. 
It also solves an initial value problem if you add an initial condition. It is a unique solution. Y of 0 equals A. It certainly is the case when, that, when you plug in X equals 0, there you get A. And if you plug in, um, yeah, since, since this is a general solution, that's going to be the only function that when you plug in 0, you get A. Okay, any solution of the initial value problem must also be able to support for that specific A. I got information about a second order differential equation. You can use stuff to prove that as well. Um, certainly, this kind of function is a solution of this kind of differential equation, a second order it's called, because you have a second derivative in there. And you can also prove that any solution must be of this form. That would be a bit trickier, I think, ultimately because you've got a second derivative here, so it might, you might wonder how things are, the constant function theorem is relevant or maybe the mean value theorem. The fundamental theorem of calculus can be proved with the mean value theorem. We will not take that approach, actually. Or the book doesn't. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll show you how, how it can be done as sort of an extra thing beyond the book. And in this subsection, you can see what we talked about last time, the idea of the proof of the mean value theorem when you work backwards. These are all the things that the mean value theorem depends on. Rolle's theorem, Fermat's theorem, Extreme value theorem, definition of continuity, definition of convergence of a sequence, boltzano weierstrass theorem, subsequences in the boltzano weierstrass theorem, and ultimately the completeness axiom. Okay? So it all comes back to that. Um, I have put applications like this on test before. And again, for sake of time, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. How would you prove that inequality? You want to let f of x equal the cube root of 1 plus x, 1 plus x to the 1 third power. You want to say, give me an arbitrary b, say, bigger than zero, <coughs> and ultimately apply the mean value theorem to f on the interval from zero to b. This function is continuous on that interval and differentiable on the interval, and it's derivative. is this, which you can write like this. The mean value theorem is going to imply that there's a C strictly between 0 and B, where F prime of C, what you get when you plug C in there, is equal to the slope of the secant line here between uh, the point, the graph of this looks like this. This point is the point is 0. When you plug 0 in there, you get 1. And this point over here is the point B, comma 1 plus B to the 1 third. There's some C where the slope of the tangent equals the slope of the secant. To prove the inequality, you know, the mean value theorem gives you an equation. To prove the inequality, you're going to need to know what um, a fact about this fraction, that if you plug a C in between 0 and B, bigger than 0 in particular, that this fraction is less than 1 third. And that helps you get the inequality. And also that's where the over 3 comes from, right there. Geometrically, this inequality is saying, that this graph is below the tangent line at this point. That's what it's saying geometrically, because the tangent line at that point has equation y equals 1 plus x over 3. So I'm leaving the details to you. I would very highly suggest practicing this before the test next Wednesday. I very likely might put something similar to this. In fact, you can even say a 
similar kind of fact that looks like this. M is say a positive integer. Any fixed positive integer M, you're going to get this kind of inequality. You can even prove the general case. You should be able to prove this for the test as well. Again, key getting the inequality is noting when you plug a C in for X here that's bigger than zero, this fraction is less than one third. that denominator there, this thing is bigger than 1 if you plug a C bigger than 0 in. Got to think about it. Is mm -hmm. that something that can be proved with induction? Too? Uh, you don't need to prove it by induction. Just give me an arbitrary fix, fixed M. <clears throat> Positive integer M. Just apply the mean value term to that function. So you don't, you don't need to prove it by induction. Things can be proved for arbitrary integers. If you can prove it without induction, then do it without induction. You only need induction when it's, you know, sort of the truth for m is dependent on the truth for m minus 1. But you don't need to do that here. Um, even though the Cauchy mean value theorem is a name theorem, I'm not going to make you responsible for it on the test. Right, maybe, this, maybe this is our first name theorem that you're not responsible for. I mean, you could read it. It's used to prove L'Hopital's rule. If I remember correctly, that's what the book uses it for. Should you know L'Hopital's rule and be able to prove it? Um, well, you won't have to do the proof of L'Hopital's rule, but you should be able to use it. And this is a um, word of advice for future teacher teachers. My first experience teaching Calc 1. Um, I spent about half a class period on L'Hopital's rule, and it wasn't enough. <coughs> they did terrible on it on the exam. I thought L'Hopital's rule, using it, was pretty easy. It's not for students who have never used it before. Okay? So it might be worth doing an example here, just to remind you how to use it. simple example that's often written down. You might have something like this. You need to calculate that. <coughs> L'Hopital's rule is useful for calculating certain kinds of limits. In certain kinds of situations, this is one of those situations. Both the top and the bottom approach zero as x approaches zero. You can't plug in zero because it's undefined at zero. And it's not completely obvious that the limit exists, but it, it will. It's called a zero over zero indeterminate form. I always have to think about how to spell indeterminate. It's not indeterminate. That's not quite a confusion. It's indeterminate. Indeterminate. I believe I'm right there. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not indeterminate like a determinant from linear algebra. It's indeterminate form. Both the top and the bottom equals zero at x equals zero. They both approach zero as x goes to zero. In that kind of situation, you can use L'Hopital's rule. There's other situations as well. And it says that if this limit exists, it will equal a new limit. of a new ratio where the new ratio has a numerator equal to the derivative of the original numerator and a denominator equal to the derivative of the original denominator. Calculus 1 students, when they're first learning L'Hopital's rule, you can show them examples like this for 25 minutes. They won't do well on the test. Okay, 80% of them won't get it. they got to practice it more than that. you got to do more examples. I'm telling you, future teachers, I learned the hard way. Okay. Okay. It's not the quotient rule. 
you're creating a new fraction, a new ratio, where the, derivative, where the top is the derivative of the original top and the bottom is the derivative of the original bottom, numerator and denominator. And it happens to be the case that this new function is continuous at zero, so now you can evaluate the limit by substitution. Plugging x equals zero, cosine of zero is one, so the answer is five sevenths. The limit does exist and it's five sevenths. Actually, in writing this equality here, I was assuming the limit was going to exist. And it does. This is not a proof, but it does. Um, if you happen to take the derivative of both the top and bottom, but it's still plugging zero, then yep. you do Then you try it again. You Sometimes you have to use it more than once. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can think of an example. Um, cos x minus 1 divided by, say, 5x squared, I believe will be an example where we have to use it twice. This is, again, a 0 over 0 determinant form. If you plug in 0 for the numerator, you get 0, 1 minus 1. Plug in 0 for the denominator, you get 0. Those functions equals zero at x equals zero, they also have a limit of zero as x approaches zero, which is really all you need for those, but anyway, um, if you apply L'Hopital's rule one, once to this indeterminate form, differentiate the top, you get negative sine x, differentiate the bottom, you get 10x. Once again, that's still a zero over zero indeterminate form. Both of these. So try it again. Differentiate the top, you get negative cos x. Differentiate the bottom, you get 10. That's continuous at x equals 0. The answer is negative 1 10. And you can check it with the graph to see that that seems right if you graph the original function. It's got a hole in this graph at x equals 0, but the graph should approach negative 1 10. <coughs> as x approaches 0. So the point 0, negative 1, 10 would not be a part of the graph of that. Okay, so, um, you know, practice a few L'Hopital's rule problems. I, I have put L'Hopital's rule calculations on old exams that I could be on your exam. Mostly I just put it on there just so you review it, so you don't become a math major without reviewing L'Hopital's rule once. Because I know, based on experience, that even for math majors, they, when they first learn it, they, for some reason, they just don't get what they're supposed to do. Okay. There are other indeterminate forms, and sometimes you have to use tricks before you can use L'Hopital's rule, but we're only considering simple examples here. This only works in when it's in those indeterminate forms. Right. right. If you just have like a five over zero, if that's what the limit evaluates to, what is that? Can't like right. You don't use L'Hopital's rule when it doesn't apply because okay. it gets you wrong answers in most cases. So that's another thing that people don't, when they first learn it, they don't quite understand. Don't use it when it doesn't, when it shouldn't be used. Okay. Once again, derivatives satisfy the intermediate value property, even though they may not be continuous. The main example we consider is the example. Well, we considered an example earlier today, but the main example in the book is on page 147, start of section 4.3. It's a piecewise function with infinite many oscillations, but those oscillations are getting smaller and smaller in a fast enough way that the derivative of the function exists at zero, but and it, therefore at every every point f prime exists, but the f prime function is, uh, is not continuous, infinitely many oscillations on any neighborhood of the origin that, for the derivative in this case, do not decrease in amplitude. And that means the derivative is not continuous at zero, but the intermediate value property is true still. The book's proof of that should be studied. It's not real long. It's a little strange. But you can follow it step by step. It's not too bad. If I put that proof on the test, I don't think I've done that in the past. But I'm not completely ruling out. Maybe, I mean, it's a tricky enough proof that I'd probably want to 
give you some hints or something. But certainly right now you should study it and strive to understand each step. The proof is on page 147 to 148. Then there's two more pages, content to know from 148 to 149 that I'm briefly just going to mention. What does it mean for a function to be concave up? It means its derivative is increasing, which by the way does include constant functions according to our book's definition. Constant functions according to our book's definition are technically concave up and concave down. F prime is, is constant also and therefore the derivative is increasing and decreasing. Constant functions are both increasing and decreasing according to our book's definition. Actually, any linear function, according to our book's definitions, is both concave up and concave down as well, whether the slope is zero or not. Although we don't typically think of those examples, they technically are part of the definition. You should know the theorem on page 149 that says if you've got a twice differentiable function on the interval, then it's concave up on the interval if and only if f double prime is non-negative, it's greater than or equal to zero on the interval. Can you repeat that? It's right there on page 149. If f double prime exists, if the function is twice differentiable, then the function is concave up on the interval if and only if the second derivative is greater than or equal to zero on the interval, not negative. <coughs> and there's a similar theorem for concave down. I said to go through page 149, but I, I don't think we're not going to really focus on what does it mean to be above tangent lines and below secant lines. Actually, in skipping the rest of section 4.3, we're actually skipping uh, one of Dr. Wetzel's favorite topics, and that's convex functions. Um, if you'd like to please Dr. Wetzel, <coughs> you can study convex functions and uh, tell him what you learned, because he did a summer project when he was a student on convex functions. So they were, they were convex functions in the higher dimensions. Okay. So I actually even had him come in and do a, a guest lecture once in real analysis on convex functions. But for this year, we're not, because I'm trying to get through the content with the videotaping. Maybe for a future year, I'll have Dr. Wetzel give a videotape of a lecture on convex functions and what he knows about them and their importance. Um, and that will be one of the videos that future real analysis students watch. Okay? I want to get to now in the last 10 to 15 minutes here, the definition of Riemann integrability here. Start chapter 5. Ooh. Yeah, so take a breath. Take a deep breath. <laughs> the definition of Riemann integrability requires some pre-definition, so to speak. The definition of a partition of an interval, which you've seen before, right? In chapter 3, we talked about the variation of a function. And a related definition, a tag partition. And then a Riemann sum corresponding to a tag partition. I am just going to write down the definition of Riemann integrability right off the bat. And as we use these ideas of tag partition and Riemann sum, I will try to explain those as we go. This definition is probably the toughest definition in the semester. And the theorems and proofs are the toughest in the semester. Yeah, deep breath. Here we go. You got a function that you'd like to integrate. So of course, if it's a nice function, you just use the fundamental theorem of calculus, but we're not there yet. <clears throat> um, function doesn't have to be continuous. The continuous functions are definitely Riemann integrable over the interval. 
let's see if I, how much I can write down without just, just from memory, without peeking at the book here. I might get some things wrong, but I'm going to try it anyway. <clears throat> we say F is Riemann integral. On the interval, just like with uniform continuity, for example, it's always with respect to some interval. I will often abbreviate Riemann integral as RI, but here I'm not. If <coughs> there exists a number that will equal the value of the integral, call it L, such that, there we go, here comes the hard part. Okay, so L is going to be the value of the integral. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that the distance between a Riemann sum for this function over this interval with respect to a tag partition is within epsilon of L. You can make your approximation to the integral as close as you want as long as the partition itself is sufficiently fine, sometimes the word used. What do I mean by fine? I mean as long as all your rectangles in your approximation to the area of the graph are sufficiently skinny, their width are all less than delta. Their widths. This, I'll come back to it. The, the symbol for the Riemann sum is not a summation. It's an S with the function name in there and also the tag partition that you happen to be thinking about. And this is super funny looking. TP, with a T as a pre-superscript, is the symbol our book uses for tag partitions. Zach, do you ever get to the stuff in actuarial science where you're using pre-superscripts? Yeah. Yeah, OK. In actuarial science, there's all these superscripts and subscripts all over the place, sometimes pre-superscripts. That's an example here of a pre-superscript. Why would you use a pre-superscript to, well, to emphasize it's not a number, for one thing. This is, this is not a number there. It's, not a, it's just a letter. Tag is what it stands for. Tag partition. I can make the distance of the Riemann sum and L within epsilon for all tagged partitions TP of the interval AB satisfying the condition that all the rectangles in the approximation or all the subintervals are sufficiently small, all less than delta. Notationally, we write that like this. Double absolute value signs around the TP. We call it the norm of the type partition. This is the norm of the type partition. And it's equal to the maximum length of all the lengths of the subintervals. Max. <coughs> These subintervals don't have to be equal length. You might be saying, isn't there just one delta x, for example, that's just the length of all of them? That's the way we teach it in calculus. Here we're allowing for different lengths for the subintervals. There's what you might call a delta x1, that's the length of the first subinterval, and a delta x2, that's the length of the second subinterval, etc. The last one you might call delta xn, the 
length of the last subinterval. So in the back of my mind, I've got a picture. I've got my interval from A to B. A I'm calling X0, B I'm calling Xn. I got these intermediate numbers in the partition, and X1 and X2 and X3 and X4 and X5, etc. Delta X1 is the length of the first subinterval. Delta X2 is the length of the second subinterval. Delta X3, etc. If this is X sub n minus 1 right there, that's delta Xn. What is a, that's, that's a partition. What's a tag partition? A tag partition is a partition with tags, with numbers in each subinterval that you're going to plug into the function to determine the height of the rectangle that you're using to approximate the area. We are ultimately talking about area here still with intervals. Area under the graph. T1 might be right there. T2 might be right here. The T's are the tags. T3 could be the right end point of the third interval. And T4 actually could be the left end point of the next one. So T3 and T4 actually could be equal to each other. Successive tags can be equal, though non-successive tags can't be equal. There's a little complication in all this. Et cetera, the tags are what you're going to plug into F to determine the heights of your rectangles. If it were a right-hand sum, you'd be picking right end points for the tags. If it were a left-hand sum, you'd be picking left end points for the tags. If it were the midpoint rule, you'd use the midpoints of each of these for the tags. You're plugging those into the function to form your Riemann sum. We can write S, F, comma, TP as a summation for a given tag partition with n subintervals like that. And for emphasis, we can write it like the book does and write the delta xi as xi minus xi minus 1. That's a Riemann sum for f corresponding to a tag partition of the given interval. You have this kind of picture in your mind about your general partition with tags giving you a tag partition. Partitions themselves are just written as a p. Uh, and I'm, I'm writing my p's cursive just because that's what I'm used to. The book doesn't use cursive. Intuitively, the value of the integral L, if the graph is above the axis, is the area under the graph. That's the value of L. You're saying you can make the Riemann sum <coughs> approximation to the area under the graph as close to L as you like, as long as all your rectangles are sufficiently skinny. The norm, which is the max of all these, is sufficiently small. If the maximum of all of them is sufficiently small, then they're all that small. If the biggest of these delta x's is less than delta, then each delta x is less than delta. Yeah, that's the most complicated definition of the text, I think. I can't think of a more complicated definition. What is L again? L is the value of the integral. What's even harder than the definition itself is using it for proofs. And we can only do the very simplest examples. The simplest example is a constant function. Actually, for using this definition for constant <coughs> functions, say you got the function 5 over the interval from 0 to 10, the integral is going to be 5 times 10 to 50. The definition for constant functions is actually not too bad. It's actually fairly easy to use in that case because what happens for 
constant functions is all your Riemann sums equal L. It doesn't matter what delta is. Delta can be anything. Any Riemann sum for a constant function will give you the right area. But once you go to non-constant functions, the difficulty level jumps up by about a factor of 100. Maybe not quite 100. The, the second easiest type of examples are well, the first example the book did, uh, where you've got a function that's 0, except at one point where it's non-zero. That's the second easiest type of example. Maybe the difficulty level is only about five to ten times harder. But once you do piecewise constant functions, or maybe straight line functions even, oh yeah, about, about a factor of a hundred in difficulty. Let's go with raised to a hundred. Raised to the hundred power in difficulty? <laughs> 10 raised to the 100 power of Google. We will do, we will do piecewise constant functions with two pieces next time. It's doable, and I have put it on the test. What? 100 times harder proof on a test? Well, yeah, it's because with constant functions, this is it's actually super easy with pure constant functions. Again, because the Riemann sums are always the same. All right. See you on Friday.